As uh, you will have heard, uh, we've been looking at a series, uh, going through a series, looking at characters of the Old Testament. And so far, we've looked at Abraham, we've looked at Joel, Jonah, Daniel, and this week, we're looking at Nehemiah. Now, the, the book of Nehemiah is the best book I have ever read on the whole topic of leadership. It's got everything in it, how to discern a vision uh, for your life and your work, how to communicate that vision, how to recruit a team, how to delegate, how to ask for things persuasively, uh, how to keep going and persevering in the face of opposition. It's got everything in it. Now, you might say to me, well, that's all well and good, Miles, but uh, I'm not a leader. Well, here's the first thing I want to say to you. Yes, you are. Leadership has been defined as influence. And the moment that we choose to follow Jesus, we become people of influence. Why? Because from that point on, people are watching you and me to see what difference it makes in our lives, to see how we live differently. This is how the early church grew. In just 300 years after the life of Christ, uh, Christianity spread around the whole of the known Greco-Roman world without any recourse to violence. Why? Because people saw that the Christians lived differently. We change the world by our example not by our opinions. In your family, in your place of work, in your community, you are a person of influence, whether you realize it or not. Now, Nehemiah was called to essentially do two things, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and to reform the community there. Now, we might not be called to such a position of national influence as that, but we are nonetheless people of influence for God's kingdom. Now, even if you were to say to me, well, maybe, Miles, but actually, I'm a failure as a Christian. You don't know what my life's like. If people look at me, they're hardly going to be inspired. Well, again, that's not the case. You see, with Christ, failure is always an event and never a person. Once we are in Christ, once we are following him, our status is changed forever. You can't be a failure and be in Christ. In fact, your calling, your potential is to shine like a star for him wherever he places you. So, Nehemiah, there's so much in it, but I want us to look at just the first 11 verses of the book. And in doing so, I want us to ask this question. How do we start? Where where do we begin in living lives of influence? Quick recap of the story. As Dan mentioned last week, uh, Babylon had invaded. The Babylonians had captured the city of Jerusalem. They'd burnt the temple. They'd pulled pulled down the city's walls, and they'd taken most of the population and marched them off to exile into Babylon. Then, of course, worldly kingdoms come and go. So fast forward about 140 years after the exile, And Babylon is no longer the world's superpower. The superpower now is Persia. And there's a Jew called Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is working in the court of the king of Persia, King Octaxerxes. And this is when we come to the reading. So it's Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. 
the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, that's around November time, in the 20th year, this is the 20th year of the king's reign. So the year is 445 BC. While I was in the citadel of Susa, so the king's palace is in Susa, which is in modern-day Iran. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some uh, other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. So how do we begin to live lives of influence? Well, the first thing we see in the life of Nehemiah is this. Start from the heart. Start from the heart. It's hard to be successful at anything in life if we don't have a passion for it. My great-grandfather was an excellent pianist, and his daughter, uh, my grandmother, was also an outstanding pianist. She could play not only classically, but she used to go down to the local cinema as a volunteer there. And this was in the days when movies were black and white and they were silent. And her job was to sit at a piano by the screen. And as the movies played, having never seen the film before, she would just look at the scenes and play along what she thought was appropriate. And then one of her sons was my father, also a very good pianist. So when I was born as a child, my parents understandably thought, ah, oh, the piano will be Miles' instrument. So they sent me off for piano lessons. But you see, there was one problem. I wasn't in the least bit interested in playing the piano. In fact, I hated it. I hated the practice, and I couldn't stand the lessons. I remember uh, very clearly having lessons. I would read the notes on the page, know exactly what they were, but purposefully play the wrong notes, trying to convince my piano teacher that I was a lost cause. <laughs> but unfortunately, she was too smart for that. But she did say to my parents, look, if he's going to improve, he does need to practice. So my parents uh, gave me a threat, what they thought was a very good threat, but which was actually music to my ears. They said, Miles, if you don't start to practice properly, we will stop the piano lessons. Yes. <laughs> so, of course, I did less practice than ever, and they had to follow through on the threat because they were being good parents, so the piano lessons stopped. Now, today, do I wish they'd continued? 
of course, I regret not applying myself. But here's the thing. It's really hard to be good at anything if you don't have a heart for it. And I believe that today, the Holy Spirit wants to give people here a new heart for what he's placed before you in life, a new passion. This is what happens to Nehemiah. He hears from some of those who have come from Jerusalem as to the state of the city and, more importantly, the state of the inhabitants in that place. And the Holy Spirit moves Nehemiah's heart. Although at this stage, Nehemiah himself has never even been to Jerusalem, when he hears the news in verse 4, this is how he records his response. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Why don't you ask God today to give you a heart for where he's placed you and importantly, for the people he's placed in your life? Because God's heart is always about people. Ask him to enable you to see them as he sees them. Ask him to enable you to feel what he feels. Now, is this risky? Maybe. The word for passion comes from the word for suffering. But without compassion, it's hard to lead in anything. Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 13, verse 12, says this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Have you ever been promised something? Or have you ever hoped for something? Have you ever dreamt for something? Had a vision for something only for it not to happen or at best to be partially fulfilled? It hurts. And this was Nehemiah's experience. He was fully aware of the warnings uh, given by Moses and the prophecies by Jeremiah that if the people disobeyed God, he would scatter them into exile. But he was also fully aware of the promise of God through Jeremiah and particularly the prophet Isaiah that if they turned to him, God would regather them in Jerusalem, in Zion. But this hadn't yet happened. A few had begun to trickle back from exile, but Jerusalem still lay in ruins. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. This is the pain Nehemiah felt as he wept that day. I have a sense that there are some people here, you don't have a cold, you don't have a cough, you don't have a limp, but you are sick in the heart. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And when this happens, it's so easy, isn't it, to close down our heart trying to protect ourselves. We no longer feel. We shut people out to try and protect ourselves from ever being let down again. And we dare not hope. The candle of hope snuffed out. What a terrible way to live. In fact, that's not living. It's just existing. But today, the Holy Spirit will help us. You see, the prophet Ezekiel, who prophesied during the time of the exile, said that God promised something. By his Spirit, 
he would remove from us a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. We are meant to be people with soft hearts and hard feet. Hearts that feel compassion, but with feet hard enough to walk into the challenge of our calling. Soft hearts and hard feet. But so often we end up as people with hard hearts and soft feet. Feeling nothing, going nowhere. But let the Holy Spirit in again today and let him perform heart surgery on us. And as he does, you will find that hope will arise. Passion will be rekindled. Vision will be recast. Christianity is primarily not about behavior modification, but about heart transformation. And like Nehemiah, let us start from the heart as we begin to be people of influence. That's the first thing, start from the heart. The second thing we see in his life and how we can be people of influence is this. Pray, don't delay. When Nehemiah hears the news from Jerusalem, the very first thing he does is to pray. So verse 4, he says, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then verse 6, he, he prays, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night. And in this prayer, which is uh, the first of nine prayers that he prays recorded in, the, in this book, he begins his prayer by acknowledging who God is. He says, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Now, this term, God of heaven, was a term that the Persians used for their God, who was called Ahura Mazda. Now, I know that sounds like a Japanese car, but that was their God, and, and, and that's the term that they used. But here, Nehemiah is saying, oh no, Lord Almighty, Yahweh, you are the one true God of heaven. Then he continues his prayer, and it's so telling, because prayer is the most eloquent expression of our priorities. If you ever wonder what is the most important thing to me in my life? Then to find out the answer, simply ask yourself this question. What do you pray about the most? What do you pray about most often? That's the answer to the question, what is most important in your life? Because prayers are an expression of our priorities. And in this sense, your prayer journal shows the direction of travel of your life and your character. The Gainsborough Hotel in the city of Bath in England was recently reopened. It's a unique hotel because it has uh, attached to it the uh, only natural hot spring spa in the whole country. And this natural hot spring has been used for thousands of years. And it was particularly popular 2,000 years ago at the time of the Romans. The Romans used it as a place of public bathing, but also as a center of worship because they felt the hot spring was a spiritual place. And a few years ago, when archaeologists were uh, excavating the hot spring there in Bath, they found these tablets of stone. And chiseled into the tablets were prayers. You see, you could go along to the hot spring, you could bathe there, but if you wanted to, you could also pay for you to have a prayer of your choice chiseled onto the tablet and buried there. So they've excavated these tablets, and it's fascinating because it shows you what the people at the time prioritized as their prayers. 
And do you know what the most common and frequent type of prayer is? It's a prayer of revenge. It's prayers of bitterness and revenge. So much so that comically, archaeologists no longer refer to these tablets as prayer tablets. They call them curse tablets. Here's an example. This is a, a prayer that was chiseled in uh, for a person called Dos, uh, Dosimedes. Dosimedes has lost two gloves. He asks that the person who has stolen them should lose his mind and his eyes. Now, I don't care how nice those gloves were. That's a pretty harsh prayer. <laughs> but it gives us an insight into the character of man. But you see, Christians have always been different. Because we've always prayed, yes, completely honest and real prayers. But we've also always prayed prayers of hope and faith. You know, that, that's why recently we, we had a, didn't we, a, a week of prayer, praying 24-7 in the HTBB prayer room. Why? And we'll do it again in September. Because we believe that when we pray in faith and in hope, things happen in our lives and we begin to influence the world around us. The theologian Karl Barth put it this way. He said, to clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. Pray, don't delay. That is the way to influence the world around you. Now, as I said, yes, we pray hopeful prayers, but also honest and real ones. And this leads on to the third thing that we can do to be people of influence. And we see it in Nehemiah too. It's this. Confess the mess. Verse 6. He prays this. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my family, have committed against you. It would have been easy for Nehemiah to blame the exile on a previous generation. It happened 140 years before he lived. But no, Nehemiah takes personal spiritual responsibility. He puts his hand up and says, Yep, Lord, I am to blame as well. Me and my family. Earlier on, when uh, Tim Key and Chi Chow led us in our prayers, they led us in a time of confession uh, because we'll be taking communion later. Now, if you're here and you, you're not used to coming to church and you thought, oh, what's this? Well, I want to encourage you. Confession is one of the most wonderful things we can ever do. It's not a negative thing. L let me explain. When I was uh, 17 years of age, I I'd just passed my driving test, and it was one of the first times ever my dad had given me the keys and let me go out in the car on my own. It was a big moment. And I, I drove to where I was going to, to um, meet a friend, and I was parking in a car park. And as I was trying to reverse into this space, there was a big um, pickup truck in the space next to the one I was reversing into. And I suddenly felt this bang. I jumped out the car. Thankfully, there wasn't even a scratch on the pickup truck's bumper. But sadly, the same was not true of my car. There was a big dent in the side of it. Well, later on, when I was driving home, I was thinking, oh, I've got a decision to make here. On the one hand, I don't want to be banned from using the car again. But on the other hand, you know, it was my fault. And deep down, I knew that honesty is always the best policy. So I thought, actually, there's not really a decision to be made. So I got home and... Uh, and, and when I showed my father the, the car with the big dent in the side, I said to him, look, I parked the car, and then when I came back, there was just a dent there. 
And he said, well, did, didn't anybody leave a note on the windscreen saying they'd done it? I went, no. He said, gosh, some people are so dishonest. I said, Dad, it's a sign of the times. Well, it was not long after that event that I came to Christ. I became a Christian. And you know, when, when we come to Christ, Jesus, he's not primarily interested in making bad people good. No, what he does is he makes the spiritually dead come alive. And when his spirit breathes life into your spirit and my spirit, things begin to happen. And one of the things that happens is our conscience grows a little. And as this happened in me, and time passed, I couldn't bear it any longer. Eventually, I thought, I've got to tell my dad the truth. But I was nervous. I, I knew he was a, a firm but fair guy but I couldn't bear it any longer. So eventually I went to him and I said, Dad, look, you know the car? Actually, it was me. I bumped it. It was my fault. I should have told you. I'm so sorry. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, thank you for telling me. I forgive you. Now, those three words, I forgive you. I don't think any lips that have ever, any words that have come from my father's lips have ever made me feel closer to him and love him more than those three words at that moment. You see, how much more? When we confess to our Father in heaven, will we know the intimate embrace of a Father who always forgives us? You see, repentance that is motiva motivated by fear leads to us hating ourselves. But repentance that's motivated by the joy of reconciliation leads to us hating the sin. So confess the mess to be blessed. The fourth thing that we can do, and we see in Nehemiah's life, to begin to live lives of influence is this. Don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember. Verse 8, Nehemiah says in his prayer, Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even your exiled people... Um, if they're at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. You see, when we uh, remember all that the Lord has done in our lives and we remember the promises that he's made to us, it results in us having a fresh, compelling vision of what he will do in the future. This is why in Scripture, the Bible commands us to remember 166 times. And we're to remember not just what God has done in our lives, but we're to remember what he's done and what he's promised to his people throughout history as recorded in the Bible. This is why the Bible is our greatest leadership weapon. And this is precisely what Nehemiah does. He remembers, and in his prayer, he's paraphrasing the promises of God as given through the prophet Isaiah by saying, hey God, do you remember what you said to us through Isaiah? I remember that you would not just scatter us, but regather us in Jerusalem. In other words, Nehemiah takes the promise 
back to the promiser in prayer. And we are to do the same. And he understood that our God is multi-generational. And some promises are given to us to temporarily steward until we pass them on to the next generation. Think of Abraham. God promised him that he would birth a nation, that through him all people would be blessed. There's that old uh, Sunday school song. Father Abraham had many sons. Really? Did he? I mean, when he died, he basically had just one boy. But the promise to Abraham is fulfilled in Isaac and in Jacob and so on and so on. And we are a continuation of the fulfillment of that promise. And we are to remember these promises. When Nehemiah eventually goes to Jerusalem... He is to rebuild the walls that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And he is to reform the community there. And how does he do that? Well, Nehemiah, along with his contemporary Ezra, Nehemiah and Ezra and the priests of Rebbebel, they gather the people in the middle of the city to listen to Scripture being read out. It's a public reading. They read from the law of Moses to remind the people of God's promises to them. The name Nehemiah means comforted by God. And this is what happens when we read God's word and we recall his promises to us. Because we begin to count the blessings and not the cost of our calling. You see, uh, Nehemiah was called with a cost. He says, I was cupbearer to the king. The historian Herodotus writes how uh, the cupbearer in the court of King Octaxerxes, to you and me, sounds like a waiter, right? He just pours the drinks. But no, 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 the cupbearer stood next to the king. He was asked his opinion. He gave advice into the king's ear. Herodotus explains how after the princes themselves, the cupbearer was the most influential person in the court. In other words, Nehemiah quite literally had the best job in the world. And he was in the palace in Susa, at the epicenter of the global superpower of his day. He was safe and he was living in luxury. He was in a palace. I mean, this was not Hotel Homey on Jalanimbi, 25 ringgit a room. This was the palace of King Octaxerxes. And what was he called to do? Leave the best job in the world leave the security and luxury of the palace and go to Jerusalem that was completely unsafe. The walls were broken. They were vulnerable to the attacking Ammonites. And what was he to do? What seemed to be an impossible job? To regather the people and rebuild the walls. He was going to face opposition, both external and internal. But what does Jeremiah say? Not, woe is me. No, he holds on to the blessings that God has promised him and his forebears. And there is power in the promises of God for your life and my life. If you remember anything from the message today, it would be this. Lay hold of God's promises and let them lay hold of you. And it will radically transform your life. A few years ago, I was part of a, uh, a mission team going for a week mission to a, a town in the north of England. And for a couple of days, we were paired up two and two and sent out in, in pairs. The guy I was paired up with, uh, I didn't know him. His name was Chris Lambriani. And, uh, you know, I was wanting to 
get to know him. So I thought, what shall I say? Oh, I know. So I said, Chris, so tell me, how did you become a Christian? And he said, oh, I became a Christian when I was in prison. I said, prison? He said, yeah, prison. And I did what you should never do with, obviously, an ex-convict. I then said, well, what were you in prison for? (laughs) Yeah, hoping it was speeding or tax evasion or something like that. And he goes, oh, I was in prison for aiding and abetting murder. Murder? (laughs) Somewhat optimistically, I said, I suppose it was, um, you were innocent? (laughs) He said, no, completely guilty. I was thinking, this is not going to go well, you know. Hello, my name's Miles. This is my murderous friend, Chris. Can we tell you about Jesus or else? (laughs) Well, he told me what had happened. You see, he had been the henchman of, well, actually, the most, the two most famous criminals England has ever produced since Jack the Ripper. They're called the Cray Brothers. The Cray brothers were the gangster kingpins of London, and Chris worked for them. And the Cray brothers wanted to get rid of a rival gangster called Jack the Hat. Honestly, this is true. It sounds like I'm making it up, right? (laughs) This is what happens in England. People go around with names like Jack the Hat. Um, So they wanted to get rid of Jack the Hat. So they did. They bumped him off. And then they asked Chris to get rid of the body. So Chris had disposed of the body. But he'd then been uh, eventually caught by the police, sentenced and imprisoned for aiding and abetting the murder of Jack the Hat. And he told me how, um, uh, you know, um, uh, it was pretty low at the moment when I, in this story when he told me this. I thought, oh my goodness. But he then told me how he'd encountered Jesus. You see... Uh, He said in prison he was such a violent guy, they'd often move him from from cell to cell. He said this one day they they just locked him in this new cell, and he said, Miles, this rage came over me, and I started to trash the room. He said, I smashed up the chair. Then he said, I went to the bed. He said, I overturned the bed. And he said, there under the bed was a box full of books. And he said, I started to just throw the books all around the room. And then he said, I I picked up the very last book in the box. He said, I went to throw it. And he said, for some reason, he said, it was like it was glued to my hand. He said, what's this? He said, I looked. And he said, I saw it was the Bible. He said, I opened the Bible. And he said, I looked down. And there, he said, these words jumped off the page at me. He said it was the promise of Jesus in John 10, verse 10. I have come that you might have life and life in all of its fullness. He said it was like that promise grabbed him by the heart. He said somehow I just knew in that moment that that promise was for me. Wow. I thought this is going to go well after all. Claim the promises of God in your life. Lay hold of them today and let them lay hold of you. So how do we live lives of influence? Well, we start from the heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a renewed passion to feel again. Pray, don't delay. When we pray, things happen. Confess the mess. Enter into that intimate, accepting love of the Father again. And don't forget to remember. Remember the promises of God for you and your life. And then finally... We see in the life of Nehemiah this gem. However big the challenge that you are facing, remember that God is bigger. Verse 11. 
he finishes his prayer with these words to God. He says, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. This man was the king of Persia, King Artaxerxes, the most powerful man on the planet, and not particularly pleasant either. Sort of a cross between Barack Obama and Kim (laughs) Jong-un. But Nehemiah understood that King Artaxerxes was just a man. And he understood that God is God. So in chapter 2, the next chapter, he goes to the king and asks him to allow him to return to Jerusalem to rebuild it. Now, this was a risky thing to do because just a few years previously, a small group of people had tried to begin to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the king had powerfully stopped them. So it was risky. But the Lord grants Nehemiah favor and the king sends Nehemiah to Jerusalem as governor of Judah, where he'd served for 12 years. And he gives them these papers showing his approval for the project and also giving Nehemiah access to royal timber so that when he gets to Jerusalem, he's able to rebuild the walls of the city in just 52 days. In the book of Revelation, The city of Jerusalem is a picture of the church, which is the body of Christ. All of God's promises are yes in Christ Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He is the fulfiller and the fulfillment. He is the sum of and substance of all of God's promises. And whatever you're facing, he will see you through with a great big amen. Amen.